Thank you very much, Diana. <laughs> and uh, what a pleasure it is to be here. I think uh, it's a nice, chill, it's a beautiful afternoon. You really, this is a heroic sacrifice on your part. The, the good news is what we're going to be talking about is Alfred Russell Wallace exploring the wet tropics. Sweaty, dank, somewhat fetid. So by the time we actually get there in this talk, I suspect this crowd will have engendered exactly the right atmosphere in this room. Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, as I'm sure most of you know, was the co-discoverer with Charles Darwin of what, uh, it's the best idea anyone's ever had, evolution by natural selection. Call me biased, I'm an evolutionary biologist after all, uh, but come up, what, what's, what's as good? Maybe the bicycle, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's, that's the second place. Um, it's a brilliant idea because it's super simple. There's this lovely reaction of Thomas Henry Huxley, this is Darwin's bulldog, after reading The Origin of, the Spe uh, 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 Origin of Species. He had a Homer Simpson moment. Duh! How incredibly stupid of me, he wrote, not to have thought of that. I mean, this is not <laughs> difficult. And yet, it explains so stupendously much including all of biological diversity. And I'm using, obviously, one always uses sea slugs as emblems of biological diversity because they're so ridiculous. I mean, they're just <laughs> fantastic. The, we've explained biological diversity, where it came from, through this diversifying genealogical process, and we've explained how that diversity fits so perfectly with its environment, how the bill of the hummingbird is perfectly built to probe the depths of the flower to recover nectar and pollen from it. That's adaptation, folks, and that's natural selection. That's two pretty big things to explain. But the third one is us. We are the product of this process. Yes, you can be a philosopher and worry about mind. Mind is an emanation of brain, and brain is something that was produced through natural selection on the plains of Africa a few hundred thousand years ago. Okay. Um, we cannot understand who we are, what we are, where we come from without, without that, exactly, without taking into consideration uh, evolutionary phenomena. Uh, and this theory, as you know, was co-discovered. Uh, here is the cover of the journal in which it was originally published. Uh, this is the Linnaean Society from 1858 somewhat, it's not that blue normally, it's been enhanced. Um, and there's a lot of really boring stuff in this issue uh, on some points in the anatomy of Nautilus Pompilius. Um, this is the biggie though. On the tendency of species to form varieties and on the perpetuation of varieties and species by natural means of selection by Charles Darwin and Alfred R. Wallace. And I'm here to talk about Alfred R. Wallace. Someone who's been almost completely eclipsed by his co-author, okay? Google evolution, do you see those probing, bespectacled eyes of Wallace peering out of you? No, you see that lugubrious, <laughs> overhung brow, <laughs> Charles Darwin. So, uh, to, to what extent has that happened? Well, the obvious metric in this day and age is to go to Wikipedia. Um, this is data on the number of times the Alfred Russell Wallace page on Wikipedia has been viewed in the last 90 days, okay? Grand total of 62, that's pretty respectable, 62,000. I, <laughs> I thought of putting up my own Wikipedia page as comparison, but then decided not to. Um, <laughs> so obviously it was a data collection failure here, or, or some, for some reason everyone really wasn't interested in Wallace on that day. Uh, the other thing that I think is very interesting, people are interested in Wallace midweek. <laughs> That's, um, and I'm also curious about this. So he's sort of averaging, what, about 700 hits a day, and then he goes up, he doubles on that one day. But let's remember that figure. And by the way, oh, the other thing is, this is a problem. Uh, this is 1,800 max, okay, because uh, I'm about to show you a graph with a very different scale. This is Darwin. We've now gone up to 18,000, okay? So actually, it looks kind of similar, except everything's 10 times bigger, okay? So he's had nearly half a million hits 
in the last 90 days. Okay, so we're almost an order of magnitude difference there. And look, <laughs> so I, well, so I did wonder. So I actually first thing is what date is that? So here's we've gone back to Wallace. Okay, so this was the 3rd of September. And that's no, there's no big anniversary or something. I mean, it's not like Darwin's birthday or Wallace's. I mean, there's no sort of obvious extrinsic. And well, let's see if it's the same. So here's, yeah, 3rd of September. So, um, so I had to do, actually, I, I think this is actually somewhat sociologically interesting. It's not related to what we're talking about at all. But <laughs> I, I dug into. Uh, Facebook archive, and I remembered that about that time, literally the first couple of days of September, my Facebook account was being bombarded by well-meaning people pointing me to a fascinating article, a great new insight about the relationship of Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin. And I suspect this is what's responsible. Here is the article in question. It was published, as you can see, <laughs> On the 31st of August, so I think we've got a little bit of latency for it to pick up. Um, yes, this is about, I mean, that's a great quotation. What at first united us was our love of science and knowledge, but our mutual respect for each other's high intellectual capacities slowly led us to be drawn to each other in a way we both had never experienced <laughs> before. Um, uh, so just, so I suspect this is what drove that trend, and I suspect that, there you can see that there are 954 Facebook shares, of which at least 930 came my way. Um, uh, I think that's what, that was the viral moment for these gentlemen in September. So here's the summary. Um, this is the 90-day figures I've just shown you. So as I say, you get an order of magnitude, give or take, and it more or less holds true in viral moments as well. Okay. So one of the questions for those of us who know and love Wallace, and Wallace is fascinating and brilliant and so much more charismatic than Darwin. I can say that because I know Janet Brown, who's a great Darwin scholar, and I teach a course with her, so I, we, we, we get on most of the time. She's out of town this weekend. Uh, um, wh what happened? Why has Wallace the great and wonderful and interesting Wallace being so comprehensively eclipsed. Now, that is not the subject of this talk, but it's always a subtext, if you like, when you're talking about Wallace. And it brings us to this. I'm going to rather maybe pompously claim that this is as close as we have the Penguin Classics to some notion of modern canon. Okay? So these are all books we take very seriously. Well, they're not all books we take. Caesar, Chaucer, Dante, 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 of course. Dickens, Euripides. I mean, you know, this, those black spines speak to something. They don't always, okay? I thought this was a bit unfortunate, actually. This was a big coup, apparently, for Penguin Classics last year. Morrissey, for those of you who don't know, Morrissey is, Morrissey is the lead, was the lead singer of The Smiths, a, a, a brilliant 80s band. And God knows what he's doing here, but... Um, <laughs> Um, he certainly had his moments. Um, uh, so let's see how Wallace and Darwin are doing on the Penguin Classics metric. Uh, well, obviously, Origin of Species. <laughs> Weird cover, Penguin Classics, I have to say. Um, this is Darwin. Uh, Descent of Man, I'm, I'm on board with that. There's more. Uh, that's the one nobody's read, but everyone's vaguely familiar with the pictures of the uncomfortable people having weird expressions, the expression of the emotions in men and animals. Uh, there's one, clearly one missing here. Yes, the Voyage of the Beagle sails across the screen. Um, so we've already got four, and there is, in fact, a fifth. Uh, Darwin's rather slim autobiographies, and there he is looking lugubrious. Let's see how... Alfred Russell Wallace does. <laughs> nothing. Which is deeply unjust. Well, nothing I say until today, though it's not actually quite published, at least in this country. But this is Penguin Classic's first venture into Wallace territory. <laughs> Woo! Um, there it is. And much better cover than any of the Darwin ones, I have to say. Um, 
Uh, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today. This is, this is Wallace's equivalent, if you like, of the Voyage of the Beagle. Darwin was at sea on the Beagle. Well, he wasn't at sea, actually. He spent a grand total of 18 months at sea on the five-year Voyage of the Beagle because he was seasick the whole time, so he spent as much time as he possibly could on land, not unreasonably under the circumstances. Wallace was eight years exploring between Singapore, in fact, a little bit further up Peninsula Malaysia, all the way into Western New Guinea. And this is the book that resulted. And it's a brilliant and beautiful and compelling scientific travelogue. Read that side by side with the much more fabled and better known Voyage of the Beagle. And you're sleeping on one side of your face, the Beagle side of your face, and you're alert and excited on the other side of your face. Um, that's by way of introduction. I have one other thing to say in the way of introduction. Um, here we are at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, which, of course, um, was built around Louis Agassiz's great museum, uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology, over our heads, or sort of that way and over our heads. Um, and there's a great Wallace link with this wonderful institution. Uh, Darwin never visited. Agassiz died. The, the great irony of this institution, it was founded in 1859. 1859, the year the Origin of Species came out by Louis Agassiz, who was a die-hard creationist. This museum was built as a monument to divine design, to divine intervention in creation. Uh, he died by the time Alfred Russell Wallace came here. Darwin had died. Wallace came here in the mid-1860s. And he toured this museum. He was on a lecture tour of the United States. He was the, giving the Lowell lectures here in Boston to start with. He toured this museum. and. He absolutely loved it. And he wrote this lovely essay in which he extols its virtue. And he publishes some photographs in that essay in which you can identify the galleries and some of the specimens which are still on display. It's actually fantastic. And he writes, it is surely an anomaly that the naturalist who is most opposed to the theory of evolution should be the first, inadvertently, to arrange his museum in such a way as best to illustrate that theory. While in the land of Darwin, this is his side swipe at the Natural History Museum in London, no step has been taken to escape from the monotonous routine of one great systematic series of crowded specimens arranged in lofty halls and palatial galleries, which may excite wonder, but which are calculated to teach no definite lesson. Uh, so as I say, there's, I, he loved this place. And he wrote this lovely essay. And part of it is, was, a tribute to something I feel. I came here, I'm a, an alien. I came here from Britain. Um, he loved the fact that Americans weren't stuck in their rut. The British were still doing, their, the, the small C conservative, doing their boring thing. Americans had this can do, we can change things. That's what he loved. And that's what that essay is about, even if it was, as I say, a bit of a sideswipe to poor old Agassiz spinning in his grave. So we have this connection. What I'm going to talk about today is Wallace. I'm going to focus on his Malay archipelago years, and I'm going to talk about where the book came from and how it fared, so to speak. Um, so I've got four sort of broad topics. One thing I am going to do, it's going to be a little bit daunting, is I'm going to put up fairly frequently big slabs of Wallace's prose. Uh, and I'll read it out, and you can read it if you don't like listening to me or whatever. Um, uh, it's not great you know, whatever, PowerPoint, PowerPoint protocol to give huge slabs of prose. But it's such beautiful stuff. And he wrote it so well um, that please forgive me. Uh, we, you'll enjoy it. You will forgive me. Um, so we're going to start, we're not, we're going to start pre-Malay archipelago. He was significantly younger than Darwin, 14 years younger to be precise. He was born in 1823 into sort of genteel, declining middle-class poverty. His father was, was actually a lawyer who never managed to hold down a job and just sort of, he had an inherited income which he, he, he invested badly away. I mean, they just kept getting poorer and poorer. So he was born, uh, Alfred was born, and this, these are the, this is the 19th century, of it, so they're all breeding like nobody's business because there's a, there's a high rate of turnover in those offspring. Um, uh, uh, so he's born there in a place where living was as cheap as possible. And it's not that grim, actually. Um, this is the house he was born in, as it is today. It's a private residence being done up rather nicely, actually. Um, in the town of Usk, which, as you can see, is quite scenic to this day. Here is the church 
in which he was uh, christened. And it actually reveals the origin of a mystery. Alfred Russell Wallace has only one L in his Russell. And it catches out everyone on Google searches, right? Because Russell has two L's on the end. Well, Russell, he had two L's on his Russell when he was baptized. So God knows what happened to his second L. Um, uh, evolution. He evolved or devolved. Um, he was barely educated. Uh, no money. They'd moved back to England. He left school at the age of 13 in order to earn a living. And most of what he did uh, was working with his brother as a surveyor. This is an era when the first railways are going in, so there's money in surveying, laying out the tracks for uh, future uh, development. Um, so here's a young Alfred Russell Wallace. Uh, he's tromping across the fields with a surveying pole in hand. He becomes interested in natural history, in the flowers that he's seeing, and so on. So this is a very uneducated, very amateurish interest in natural history, in plants initially. But then he meets a man called Henry Walter Bates, who's actually a couple of years younger than him. He meets him, so Wallace is 21, Bates is 19. Um, and Bates is similar. He's also basically an autodidact. He's also interested in natural history, but he's way more sophisticated than our Alfred. He has an interest in beetles, and he converts beetle, uh, Wallace almost overnight into a beetle person. If I'd been asked before how many different kinds of beetles would be found in any small district, I should probably have guessed 50 or the outside of 100, and thought that a very liberal allowance. I learned there were many hundreds could easily be collected, and there were probably a 1,000 different kinds within 10 miles of and for those of you who know it, Leicester, anything within 10 miles of Leicester is <laughs> remarkable. Um, and I've argued um, in a couple of places that I think the beetle thing was absolutely critical in the development of Wallace's and, in fact, Darwin's thinking and Bates. This is a lovely quotation from a famous 20th century biologist called J.B.S. Haldane when asked... What has a lifetime of studying nature taught you about the creator? He's responded, well, the Almighty clearly has an inordinate fondness for beetles <laughs> because there's so many of them. There's about 350,000 species of beetles that we've hitherto described. There are plenty more out there, folks. Um, and if you want to call them something, whatever the generic name, Andrew Berryi. Any undergraduates here? We're looking at an A. Um, <laughs> Uh, and just to, just to put that into comparison, um, you think of birds as hyperdiverse, right? Blue ones flitting through the forest, and a green one flying high there, and a red one singing. No, there's just 10,000 of them. Okay, it's kind of pathetic. And by the way, we've probably done most of the birds. We haven't come close to describing all the beetles. So this is a massive underestimate. This is pretty on the money. Uh, and by the way, in Britain, this was why they were key in Britain. Britain, if you've ever been there, is a windswept, biologically deportate place. Miserable. <laughs> blighted. Uh, imagine you were interested in butterflies. 65 species. And a couple of those are ones which occasionally get blown over from France, right? I mean, they don't even <laughs> truly resident. Whereas you've actually got a respectable level of diversity in beetles. So if you're going to be interested in exploring the patterns and causes of diversity, you need some diversity, and beetles provided that for these guys. They also provided, because they're su it's such a big, broad opportunity scientifically, it gave them, a, a, if you like, a professional leg up. When Wallace met Bates, Bates had already published a scientific paper. He was, he'd gone beyond being just a, a casual amateur. He was a scientist, if you like. Uh, and, what, and this is, again, the good old days. The paper was Note on Coleopterous Insects Frequenting Damp Places. Many a long day in sunshine and in shower has seen me wading in those miry paradises in the praiseworthy endeavor to effect my little towards the advancement of our favorite science. Wallace followed up. He's a little bit later. This is his entirety of his first publication. <laughs> Pathetic. Um, especially what he's done is he's found a beetle, and then the editor says, the other insects in my correspondence list are scarcely worth publishing. <laughs> Loser. But still... A publication, ladies and gentlemen, is a publication. As they say, uh, interview committees can count, they can't read. Uh, just, uh, and, and of course, you know this, I'm sure, this is this wonderful cartoon of the young Charles Darwin, 
doing what he loved to do, hunting beetles. Um, there is Darwin, ride, go it Charlie, riding his beetle. So that's one strand in the development of Wallace's thinking. The other is what you might call theoretical. He read a book which was published anonymously in 1844. We now know it was by the uh, encyclopedist Robert Chambers, entitled The Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. And this was bad science, but it was a book which had this sort of progressive vision of things we would say evolving, now changing from simple into complex. And that applied to culture, it applied to animals, plants, to the universe. Okay? Now, this, as I say, this is not a great piece of science, but it was a bestseller. Abe Lincoln read it. The young Queen Victoria had it read out to her by her young husband, Prince Albert. So it's, I've tried reading this book. I've never made my way through it. Have you, David? No. Not even David Haig has managed to read this. Um, uh, it's, it's unreadable. And the notion of having it read to you in a heavy German accent just before <laughs> bedtime is, is. But Wallace, Wallace was turned on. He liked this idea of what was then sometimes called transmutation, that species weren't fixed, that they could change one into another. This is an ingenious hypothesis strongly supported by some striking facts and analogies. So we, Bates and Wallace, are going to go on a scientific adventure. We're going to go and do science in order to explore this question. So where, they're nobodies. They're not like Darwin was connected. This was a, it was a sort of privileged position to go on the Beagle. They don't have any of those connections. So they're going to have to pay their own way. So what they're going to do is collect specimens for sale to fund their scientific enterprise. Where are they going to go? Well, this shows you just how naive they were. They read a book by an American lepidopterist in, uh, published in 1847, Mr. Edwards, who'd been up the Amazon, in which he described the primary rainforest. Monkeys are frolicking through festooned bowers or chasing in revelry over the wooden arches. Squirrels scamper in ecstasy from limb to limb unable to contain themselves for joyousness. So, I mean, if I read that, I didn't know any better. The, the allure of exploding ecstatic squirrels is... So, off our boys go. They go uh, to... This is actually a figure from Bates's book about the trip. They go to the Amazon. They go to Brazil. They're looking for these high-profile specimens in particular. This is a cock of the rock. This is an umbrella bird. These get good money on the natural history. They have an agent in London, good money on the natural history markets. They can sell these things. They split up fairly early on in these piece, presumably to maximize the efficiency of what they're collecting and where. Wallace spends four years up, mainly up the Rio Negro. Extraordinary journeys. Nearly dies several times. His younger brother comes out to help and does die. Uh, first contact uh, with native peoples. Extraordinary animals and material that he's acquiring. Uh, but it nearly kills him. And after four years, and by the way, Bates stays out for another five years. So, uh, seven years, sorry. Um, uh, it's time to come home. So this is 1852. He's come across the continent all the way down river. And he's got all this stuff, this fantastic stuff. He's a nobody, remember. This is going to make him. And he's even brought 30-odd living animals, spider monkey, toucan. Just imagine, he's a nobody walking into a scientific salon in Victorian, mid-Victorian Britain with a toucan, with that fantastic bill on your arm, right? This is going to be the making of him. So here's the good ship Helen. Three weeks into the journey, there is, I love this part of the story, there's a knock on the door of the cabin. He's the only, this is a freighter. He's the only passenger. He's sharing a cabin with the captain. The captain knocks on the door. He says, Mr. Wallace, I think you should know. The ship's on fire. His first big mistake was that, oh, <laughs> oh, I wonder what's happening. So they open the hatch. What, this is some um, poorly stowed cargo, which was highly flammable, and just presumably friction had caused it to. And so they just oxygenated the fire. This is a, this is a pile of tropical sun-dried tinder, OK? They have to abandon ship instantly. Uh, 
Wallace, in fact, is weak and in such a hurry to get off the ship that he rips the skin off his hands. The clinker hulls of the lifeboats have been upside down on the surface of the deck, so they're dried out. So this, they're basically sieves. So now they're bailing to save their lives. They're not going to do that all night because the um, timbers are going to swell as the water comes in. But this vision of Wallace with his flayed hands desperately scooping salt water out of the bottom of his boat, it's not going well. What are they going to do? Weather's fine. What they're going to do is stay by the wreck, the burning pyre, in the hope of rescue. So Wallace, and I think this is the most poignant episode in the history of science, Wallace witnesses the destruction of his collections. The living animals, remember there are 30-odd of them, they're sprung by, their, by the flames from the cages. They go out, he sees them, and he writes about this, going out to the bowsprit. There's nowhere to go, infinite ocean. They go back to the flames. But surely they're going to be rescued. Uh, no. Ten days adrift in an open boat. But Wallace is British, remember? <laughs> and I love this. I love this part of the story. So this has happened. Um, uh, we got rid of that. We're in the open boat. Wallace is British. So what happens? Well, as he writes, this is, I think, three days into the 10-day. He doesn't know he's going to be rescued. Um, During the night, I saw several meteors. In fact, could not be in a better position for observing them than lying on my back in a small boat in the middle of the Atlantic. That's putting a positive spin on things. Anyway, so he gets home. And 50 times since I left Belém have I vowed, if I once reach England, never to trust myself more on the ocean. Not an unreasonable response. But he basically writes that, turns around, realizes he's got to do it. If he's going to do it, if he's going to make it, if he's going to become it, he's got nothing. He's got to do it all over again. So that's what he does. And by the way, I just, <laughs> hats off. I mean, I don't know about you, um, and I don't want to offend any accountants here, but if that had happened to me, I'd say, OK, I think I've, I've done enough of expeditionary science. I'll become an accountant or, you know, or something. Um, uh, so now, this is our focal journey. This is the Malay Archipelago journey. Uh, one of the things he did manage to salvage, rather remar- remarkably, because he just had a small box of drawings and notes that he managed to rescue from the burning wreck, were his notes for the mapping of the Rio Negro. And he published this map uh, with the, um, the Royal Geographic Society in London. He also pumped out a, a book on the palm trees of the Amazon and wrote a book on his travels on the Amazon, which we will turn to shortly. It was his attempt to be a Voyage of the Beagle type book. This is important because it came to the attention of the powers that be in the Royal Geographic Society. They were impressed by this loser, and they made it their business to help him go to his next place. He needed money. It's expensive to get to Southeast Asia, so he was actually sponsored by the government um, and sailed to Singapore. So he came back in 1852 from the Amazon, and as I just 18 months later, uh, in March 1854, he's heading off again. On and this is uh, Singapore, where he started. This was, and this, by the way, is the map from the book, beautiful Victorian map, which bloody penguin refused to reproduce. Um, uh, this and the, the dark lines are his journeys. This is an extraordinary set of journeys, usually in small boats, um, and all the time. And this is inconceivable. He was collecting, collecting, collecting 125,000 specimens, th- thousands and thousands new to science. And that's, a, you know, today when you collect something, fine, I've got it, you put it in liquid nitrogen or whatever, and you, you call up FedEx and they take it back, right? He's dragging it around. He, can't, he can only ship stuff very episodically from a few, quote, centers of civilization. Um, extraordinary journeys in extraordinary places. And as I said, last time he was particularly keen on the cock of the rock and the umbrella, but this time the headliners. And again, this is both because they're biologically fantastic, also uh, because they're commercially valuable the birds of paradise. And just to remind you, birds of paradise are ridiculous. Um. (laughs) 
Yeah, Success. Oh. <laughs> so it was worth it, is the point. Um, now, he essentially has to go native. He's, he's basically backpacking. Darwin, when he's on the voyage of the Beagle, is the guest, the captain. When, the, when he lands, the local hacienda sends a coach and four to take him on a nice tour. Um, this is actually a rather nice reconstruction of one of Wallace's huts. Wallace, remember, was a surveyor. He was very anal about keeping records. So we know what he was living in in each of these places. This is, and here's the picture of the same hut. And you can't see it very well. This is from the Malay Archipelago. There's Wallace. The hut was too small for him to actually sit down in. So he's doing all his work at a table on the stilts under the hut. He's dependent upon this kind of transport. Um, and the cooperation, I guess, of kids like this. Um, but a lot of very dodgy, small open boat travel, uh, which, <laughs> being Wallace, this is actually from his autobiography. It's amazing. It, it, some of the stuff he did was just it would put, would put, cause Mark Spitz's hair or whatever the new um, pothead is called um, to stand on end. Phelps. Um, um, he could barely swim. This was partly due to a physical deficiency, which I was unable to overcome. My legs are unusually long for my height, and the bones are unusually large. The result is that they persistently sink in the water, bringing me to a near vertical position, and their weight renders it almost impossible to get my mouth above water. <laughs> now, he's collecting, collecting, collecting. And this is, and again, it's inconceivable to us as modern day collectors, the tribulations he had to put up with. The flies that troubled me most in New Guinea were a large kind of blue bottle. These settled in swarms on my bird skins when first put out to dry, filling their plumage with masses of eggs, which if neglected the next day produced maggots. They would get under the wings or under the body where it rested on the drying board, sometimes actually raising it up an inch, half an inch, by the mass of eggs deposited in a few hours. And every egg was so firmly glued to the fibers of the feathers as to make it a work of much time and patience to get rid of them without injuring the bird. So that's the collecting. And the, the, the accounts in the Malay Archipelago of the feral dogs that would just come and just snaffle his entire set of specimens. Um, the ants that would just slowly degrade his material. Appalling. But, and his personal situation obviously was appalling as well. Um, and, but get a sense of this writing. It's wonderfully, slightly tongue in cheek. Ever since leaving Dobbo on the Arrow Island, I had suffered terribly from insects who seemed here bent upon revenging my long-continued persecution of their race. I just think I love that. At our first stopping place, sand flies were very abundant at night. Da, 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 da. My feet and ankles especially suffered and were completely covered with little red swollen specks which tormented me horribly. On arriving here, we were delighted to find a house free from sand flies or mosquitoes. But in the plantations where my daily walks led me, the day-biting mosquitoes swarmed and seemed especially to delight in attacking my poor feet. I, you may well laugh. After a month's incessant punishment, these useful members, his feet, rebelled against such treatment and broke into open insurrection, throwing out numerous inflamed ulcers, which were very painful and stopped me from walking. So I found myself confined to the house with no immediate prospect of leaving it. Wounds or sores in the feet are especially difficult to heal in hot climates, and I therefore dreaded them more than any other illness. But the stuff he was encountering was magical. This is a species of birdwing butterfly, um, which uh, uh, Wallace discovered and described and named, it's called, now called uh, Trogonopter brookiana, in honor of his rather extraordinary friend, James Brooke, the so-called White Raja of Sarawak in North Borneo. But perhaps one of the coolest things he found was a new, previously undiscovered species of bird of paradise. This is Wallace's standard wing bird of paradise. Not on New Guinea, on a couple of offline islands. You can see they're displaying here. They really are fantastically silly birds. But look at them. This is amazing. There's the females checking the boys out. Oh, go for it, man. Um, so he's schlepping all this stuff around. He's having to stay alive himself. He's having to combat all these things which are trying to rip all his specimens apart. The other problem is, how do you know what's what? Okay, You, you can't go online and say, you Google 
hornbills of Southeast Asia and get a nice list with a dichotomous key which will tell you who's who. So he had actually this wonderful Latin tome on the birds of the world that he dragged around with him. Um, so it's hardly surprising. The collector, he writes, that collector at home or abroad, <laughs> what he really requires is to have a compact and cheap volume by which he can name, if not all, at least well-marked species. Give me a field guide, man, is what he's saying. He's just invented the field guide, actually. So he's doing this in extraordinarily adverse circumstances. It was stunningly successful. Here's that same bird of paradise. This is a paper he published shortly after getting back, descriptions of new birds from the Malay archipelago, in which, and now some of these, by the way, have since been synonymized, so this is a bit of an exaggeration, but it gives you a good sense of what he achieved. 212 new bird species collected by me in those eight years. Now, just to put that into perspective, finding new bird species is tricky. If I was to, uh, we could find a new microbe species on my person right now, and if I told you to go and find a weevil from somewhere, as long as you can climb tropical trees, you could find a new species of weevil. To find new species of birds, even then, was that's, that's a high bar, because people care about birds. People notice birds. People record birds. So one is this, is, this is hard. And two, given the fact we have about 10,000 birds that we've described, that's 2% of all birds he discovered in eight years. That's phenomenal, especially when you consider the conditions he was doing that in. And part of what he was doing, he was so he's down here. He was very interested in what was where. Biogeography is the science of what is there. And he discovered the discontinuity between orange Australia and pink Asia. Uh, and it, as you, he didn't call it. T.H. Huxley called it. This is Wallace's line. So a brilliant field naturalist. He crossed between Bali and Lombok down here and noticed that some of the birds he'd seen there weren't there. But that's just collecting. Obviously, that sort of headlining stuff that he was doing was what we might call theoretical thinking. Uh, and he had two great theoretical papers. Uh, so this is his discovery of evolution by natural selection. Came in two phases. The first paper he wrote as a guest of uh, the White Rajas of Sarawak, James Brook, at the base of this mountain, Santabong Mountain. Um, and this is it's known as the Sarawak Law Paper from 1855. Very simple idea, but brilliantly expressed and powerful. Every species this is a quotation, has come into existence coincident both in time and space with a pre-existing closely allied species. What does that mean? Well, things cluster geographically. If I find a kangaroo, where do I go and find another kangaroo? I stay in Australia. I don't go to Norway to find <laughs> it, right? People don't like Norway here. Um, so why, was, why is that? Because you have an ancestral species of kangaroo which spins off descendant species of kangaroo. In other words, that clustering is, is the product of a genealogical process. Same in time. If I find a certain dinosaur in that stratum in the fossil record, where do I look for similar dinosaurs? Do I go much more recent? Do I go much more ancient? No. I look in contiguous strata, right? Why? Because you've got the same ancestor descendant process. He sends this off. Remember, he's still a nobody. This is going to stir them up, right? This is halfway to a theory of evolution, right? He's incredibly disappointed. Nobody cares. Nobody notices. So one person is sympathetic. Charles Darwin writes to him, says, yeah, people aren't interested in these sort of big, big picture questions. And that's why the next time Wallace had a smart idea, he, instead of sending it to a journal to publish straight off, he sent it to Charles Darwin. Darwin would place it. This is the second part of the theory of evolution by natural selection, natural selection. He had malaria. He's in the Spice Islands. He's feverish. He glimpses natural selection. As Soon as he's well enough, he writes it down and sends that manuscript off to Charles Darwin. This is the luckiest thing that ever happened to Charles Darwin, OK? Because Normally, everything he's done, he's sent straight to an editor, to a journal. It's published, reviewed, published, just as it is today. And if he'd done that this time, Darwin would have woken up three months later, scooped. Right? So here we are, Downhouse, a rather charming contemporary print. Okay, so this is Downhouse, where Darwin lives. 
Um, you probably know the story, but it bears repeating. Here's Darwin's study. And here is a completely bogus reconstruction of <laughs> Darwin reading his mail. This is the 18th of June, 1858. And he's, he's got people, it turns out to be a spectator sport. Um, <laughs> these are his colleagues. Oh, I wonder what he's reading now. Well, so he gets this letter from this person he barely knows. Uh, and he recognizes it's his own theory. Okay? So what, all my originality, whatever it may amount to, will be smashed. What happens? Well, Charles Lyle, the geologist who was uh, Charles Darwin's friend and colleague, and also Joseph Hooker, the botanist, intervene. They save the day. They arrange for a joint publication. They haven't consulted Wallace, but they're going to put out a joint publication. These are my students. I take the Linnaean Society. I'm sorry to say they're a little disrespectful. Bastards. Um, just, no, there's none of you. There's, there's a bunch. Of, you were one of them once, yes. Um, uh, this was the 1st of July. So this is the publication, The Theory of Evolution by Natural Selection. Here's the original paper. There it is. Darwin. Wallace is now second author, notice. Um, but it's out. Everything bad is going wrong. For, everything is going wrong for the main players. Darwin's not there because his baby's just died. What's Wallace doing? Wallace, of course, doesn't know what's happening. He's finally made it to New Guinea. He's miles away. But he's always, that, this is where he's been aiming to get to the whole time. But it's all gone belly up. I got over this fever, but followed by such soreness uh, that I could put nothing but solid between my lips, it obliged to subsist entirely on slops. His men got sick. One of them died. This is right in that period, between that two-week period between the letter arriving in Darwin's home and the publication. So everything's going badly. And, uh, but how does Wallace respond to this? Ah, if I send a manuscript to a senior colleague and then heard back that I was second author on a paper published by that senior colleague, I would be irked. <laughs> okay? Not Wallace. And remember the situation. He is a nobody. Darwin's big. Darwin's famous. Darwin's a somebody. This is, and I love this letter. It's to his mother. Dear mummy. You're not going to believe this. I've just got these letters. Da, 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 da. This assures me the acquaintance and assistance of these eminent men on my return home. He's made it, finally. And what, a, what does Darwin do? Darwin knuckles down, and within about a year, he's pumped out the origin of species. Okay? Now, the origin of species, I think, mentions Wallace by name four times. It's not, and it's an I book. It's not a we book. Okay? Um, does Wallace object? And by the way, Wallace had his own origin pro project. We know this from his notebooks at the time. He was planning on writing his own book about evolution. He nixed it when he heard that Darwin was doing this. Okay. Is he resentful? <laughs> Hell no. Mr. Darwin has given the world a new science, and his name should, in my opinion, stand above that of every philosopher of ancient or uh, modem times. The force of admiration. The force of admiration can no further go. Okay. So he's still out there. He comes back three years after the publication of The Origin of Species. He comes back in 1862. And he's successful, fated. He doesn't, nothing gets incinerated on the journey home this time. Um, it's time. And so within a couple of years, he writes to Darwin. They're now friends. Um, I'm, you know, I'm going to start writing this book. I have, have to have it ready by Christmas. It's not going to happen, though. He's super, super busy. He's turning his collections into scientific publications, if you like. He's all over the place scientifically. And by the way, just to give you an example of what he was doing, this is, um, this is a famous idea in evolutionary biology. And it's usually associated, what is a species? A species is something that can have sex with a fellow member of that species and reproduce. That's what we call a species. It's known as a biological species concept. Um, and it's most closely associated with a famous Harvard, Harvard biologist Ernst Meyer. There it is. The, and high schoolers learn this definition. I force it down the throats of my students. Turns out that Wallace had come up with that definition in 1864, a mere 80 years earlier. Species are merely those strongly marked races or local forms which, when in contact, do not intermix and when inhabiting distinct areas are generally believed to have separate origins to be incapable of producing fertile offspring. Same, same deal. Okay. He's doing a hell of a lot of science. He gets married. 1866, 
Um, this is all he has to say in his two-volume autobiography about his wife, um, which seems, especially, it even gets her age wrong, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, he, he got on all right with her dad. And by the way, it was a lovely and rich, I love this. This is obviously a very late photograph. It was a great relationship. Um, so he's busy. That's one thing holding him back. But there are other things holding him back with this book project, one of which is the decided failure of his previous attempt. So I said that in that short period that he was back in Britain between the, the burning boat and heading out to Singapore, he wrote his, if you like, Voyage of the Beagle, or attempted Voyage of the Beagle, scientific travelogue from the Amazon. Here is a copy, 1853, um, uh, my proudest possession, the first edition of this baby. <laughs> um, uh, now, um, for a start, this was not a well-received book. And I think this is one of the <coughs> meanest things that Darwin ever wrote. So remember, this book is hugely handicapped. Everything has been incinerated. He's desperately trying to, to cobble things together from memory. And Darwin writes to H.W. Bates that I'm a little disappointed in Wallace's book on the Amazon. Hardly facts enough. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your support. Um, and Wallace re recalled only 750 copies were printed. That was in 1853. And when he came back nine years later, only 500 had sold. So this was not exactly herring off the shelves. Okay, So he's got a sort of inferiority complex about his ability as a travel writer. And that is enhanced by a book that comes out in 1863, so exactly the same time frame. This is Bates's book about his Amazon experience. So part of it's shared with Wallace, but it's mainly Bates's own independent adventures. This does really well. Okay? And now, so there's this sort of competitive thing. <laughs> um, so, and he writes to, uh, Wallace writes to Darwin, I'm a very bad hand at writing anything like narrative. I want something to argue on, and then I find it much easier to go ahead. I, I'd rather despair, therefore, of making so good a book as Bates. There's the competi competitive thing. Though I think my subject is better. Like every other traveler, I suppose, I feel dreadfully the want of copious notes on common everyday objects, sights and sounds and incidents, which I imagined I could never forget, but which I now find it's impossible to recall with any accuracy. Okay, so there are all these things sort of holding him back. Um, but finally, now that he's been back for six years, he writes to Darwin, you'll perhaps be glad to hear that I have been for some time hammering away at my travels, but I fear I shall make a mess of it. Um, so he did have copious notes, and we still have um, many of those notes. It's actually really cool. You can go, he took these beautiful longhand notes in the field, and many of the most immediate and exciting passages of the book are pretty much transcribed directly from his first-hand accounts. You know, he gets back to camp and writes it all down. It ends up in the, in the book. Um, he's also commissioning artwork, needless to say. Um, and this is a fantastic rendition of this extraordinary temporary encampment that's a seasonal encampment in Dobbo in the Aru Islands off western New Guinea. Uh, that, so this was a professional artist who drew it from Wallace's sketches. So the book comes out in March 1869 with these, some of these lovely, gorgeous illustrations. It's initially two volumes. It's fairly rapidly condensed into a single one. And there's this lovely dedication to Charles Darwin, author of The Origin of Species. I dedicate this book not only as a token of personal esteem and friendship, but also to express my deep admiration for his genius and his works. Now, um, how did he write? What did he do? How did he manufacture this book? I mean, what, what were the writerly challenges? Well, the first thing is his journeys, you saw from that map, were super complex. Many places he went to multiple times, so it was very convoluted. So he figured that a straight chronological telling would be disastrous because, oh, and then I came back here again. Remember, on page 27 I was there and so on and so forth. So he tried, he tried to condense multiple journeys into one um, narrative in each case. And in general, he's extremely successful. Um, and the, the way he, d he handles that is by, if you like, focusing on vignettes. And he's a master storyteller. And he, he can create these wonderful sort of uh, pen pictures. This is brilliant. This is a 
a, he's in a village way up in the back country in Aru, off New Guinea. And he meets a man who says, my country is Wanumbai. Anyone can say Wanumbai. I'm an Orang person from Wanumbai. But England? England? Who ever heard of such a name? Do tell us your real name, the name of your country, and then we, when you're gone, we can know how to talk about you. England? Right? To this luminous argument and remonstrance, I could oppose nothing but assertion, and the whole party remained firmly convinced that I was for some reason or other deceiving them. Um, this is really long, I apologize. But it's, it's also, I think, a wonderful piece of travel writing. He slips into the present tense. Um, and you have this very immediate description of what's happening in his environment. Early morning before the sun has risen, I hear the loud cry of wah, 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 which resounds through the forest, changing its direction continually. This is the great bird of paradise going to seek his breakfast. Others soon follow his example. Lorries and parakeets krill, cry shrilly, cockatoos scream, king hunters croak and bark, and the various smaller birds chirp and whistle their morning song. As I'm listening to these interesting sounds, I realized my position as the first European who's ever lived for months together in the Aru Islands, a place which I'd hoped rather than expected ever to visit. I think how many besides myself had longed to reach these almost fairy realms and to see with their own eyes the many wonderful and beautiful things that I'm daily encountering. Somebody had brought in a black cockatoo brought in last night, which I must skin immediately, and so I jump up and begin my day's work very happily. But I want to introduce you to my favorite feature of Wallace's writing. Um, and you will recognize this. Uh, I'm sure everyone recognizes that. We have Singaporeans in the audience, I know. This is a durian, um, an extraordinary fruit, a delicacy in Southeast Asia. Uh, but the reason I want to introduce this is a, uh, this is a sample of Wallace's writing. It's a famous passage. Um, it has what I call the Wallace slide. He's a scientist. He's going to start off with almost, it's a boring, dry, sort of technical, botanical description. But then he's going to slide. And his enthusiasm and his passion is just going to overwhelm the science. The slide from science into passion. The five cells are satiny white within and are each filled with an oval mass of cream-colored pulp, embedded in which are two or three seeds about the size of ch chestnuts. This is the boring description. This pulp is the eatable part, and its consistency and flavor are indescribable. A rich butter-like custard, highly flavored with almonds, gives the best general idea of it, but intermingled with it come wafts of flavor that call to mind cream cheese, onion sauce, brown <laughs> sherry, and other incongruities. Then there is a rich glutinous smoothness in the pulp which nothing else possesses, but which adds to its delicacy. It's neither acid nor sweet nor juicy, yet one feels the want of none of these qualities. For it's perfect as it is, it produces no nausea or other bad effect, and the more you eat of it, the less you feel inclined to stop. In fact, to eat durians is a new sensation worth a voyage to the East to experience. I just think that is a fantastic, powerful, <laughs> evocative piece of writing. The other device that he uses and he's a scientist, remember, is, I'm going to call it deadpanning it. He tells a story. He doesn't, his stories are so damn good, he doesn't need to embroider. He doesn't need to boys own the story. Boys own there being a transitive verb. Um, and this is actually rather well, the point is rather well made. Albert Bickmore was a zoologist at the American Museum of Natural History who published a book visiting many of the same places at more or less the same time. And in fact, often the two books Wallace's Malay Archipelago and um, Bickmore's book were reviewed together. Uh, and by reading them side by side, you really get a sense of why Wallace is a keeper and Bickmore is not. So here's, both of them are describing an, account, an encounter, and they both have illustrated it with a big snake. Um, and you already get it. This is, this is Bickmore killing the python. Okay? Uh, for Wallace, this is eject, ejecting an intruder. You've, so Wallace, there was a great scuffle as the snakes coiled around the chairs and posts to resist his enemy. At least length of the men caught hold of its tail, rushed out of the house, running so quick the creature seemed quite confounded, tried to strike its head against a tree, missed, however, and let go, and the snake got under a dead trunk close by. It again poked out, and again the Buru man caught hold of its tail and running away quickly dashed its head with a swing against the tree. It was then easily killed with a hatchet. It was about 12 feet long, very thick, capable of doing much mischief and of swallowing a dog or a child. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a nice... Straight account. This is Bickmore. 
Suffering the acutest agony from the deep wound I'd already given him, he raised his head high out of the midst of his huge coil, his red jaws wide open, his eyes flashing fire like live coals. I felt the blood chill in my veins. For an instant, we glanced into each other's eyes and both instinctively realized that one of us two must die on the spot. So I'm happy to say that Darwin loved the book. He sort of had to with a dedication like that, didn't he? I've finished your book. It seems to me most excellent and the same uh, pleasant to read. That you ever returned alive is wonderful after all your rest from illness and sea voyages, especially that most interesting one to wague you and back. Of all the impressions that I've received from your book, the strongest is that your perseverance in the cause of science was heroic. I think that's actually a wonderful statement about the book. Your descriptions of catching the splendid butterflies have made me quite envious, and at the same time have made me feel almost young again. So vividly have they brought before me in my mind old days when I collected, though I never made such captures as yours. Certainly, collecting is the best sport in the world. I shall be astonished if your book is not a great success. So finally, I just want to talk, and this is going to be quick, never fear. I just want to talk briefly about the reception and the impact. And I want to tell you about the most peculiar aspect of this book. We have just described how this period of Wallace's life was extremely formative and, if nothing else, was, was very significant for the, for the fact he discovered the best theory that anyone's ever discovered. You know, that's kind of big. And we, know, and we know that he knew it was big. Remember that letter to his mother? Right? He knows this is big. Okay? Now, does he write some interesting insight about how he stumbled across these ideas? He's going to be somewhat modest. But how, does he write a great account of, discover, of writing the Sarawak Law, of being an imp fever in the Spice Islands and discovering natural selection? No. Does he mention these ideas in the book? No. It's actually extraordinary that he would write this book. And this book, by the way, it's long and detailed. This is from one of the reviews. It sort of makes the point rather nicely. There's a review from the Atlantic Monthly. Mr. Wallace apparently exhausts a very copious diary in the production of his book and seems almost to have made it a point of conscience not to leave anything out. Yeah, OK. So, <laughs> so it's, he, he's not missed it because it sort of he had to condense too much stuff in there. Well, maybe you say he didn't want to talk about science. It was too technical, too technical. This is a travel book. It's, a, it's, you know, it's for your uncle at Christmas time, right? Um, no, this is the most boring page in the book. This, uh, I mean, this is not sparing his reader anything. So this is, he's in Borneo. Here are the dates. And here is the w weather on each night and the number of moths he caught. <laughs> okay, so this is a no-hold sci barred scientific account. So that's not the reason. Maybe he's controversy averse. He doesn't want to go into the dangerous waters, the controversial wa waters of the Darwin-Wallace theory. No. He discusses the Darwin-Wallace theory. He refers to it. Here's something we're talking about, two forms coming to look at like each other, what we call mimicry. This principle of variation and that of, quote, natural selection or survival of the fittest, as elaborated by Mr. Darwin in his celebrated origin thesis, offers the foundation of such a theory. No, there's absolutely no mention of his own contributions. It's actually, so, and, it, and it's difficult really to make, I mean, you just have to think this guy is pathologically modest. Um, I mean, and he always saw Darwin as the senior party. He always deferred to Darwin. Darwin was his hero. He read the uh, Voyage of the Beagle as a young man. So he always felt it was a privilege to be part of Darwin's world. But that didn't prevent him from having some very serious disagreements with Darwin uh, down the road. But just to give you an idea of how pathologically modest, Wallace's second best book was written after that tour of the United States. And he'd given lectures on evolution, his take on evolution by natural selection. And people had told him, this is great, actually. I've read The Origin, but you've explained everything so much better. Why don't you write down your ideas? So he wrote down his ideas. So this is his, his origin of species. What title did he choose? Darwinism. <laughs> okay. Now it's really remarkable the extent to which he has s eclipsed himself. Um, that's the first thing in terms of the, the sort of reception and impact. The same thing, and this is kind of cool. 
It's alive and well, scientifically, the ideas that Wallace developed. So here, here is this area where the bridge from Australia to uh, the Asian zone is. Um, and this is a new analysis of, of biogeographic variation, Wallace style. And there it is, an update of Wallace's zoogeographic regions of the world. That was in science last year. Um, this came out a, a couple of, uh, when was this, 2010, I think. This is a paper. Wallace was so solid in his observations and so reliable and so good in his note taking that conservation biologists have been able to use that as a baseline for the density of the orang populations in Borneo, where Wallace was um, working, um, and use that to, to calibrate the rate of uh, loss. So fine, so there's been a scientific impact. Well, that's kind of what we'd expect. But perhaps the coolest thing about this wonderful book is it had a literary impact as well. Uh, and not many books of science have literary impacts. This is Joseph Conrad. And remember, Conrad's writing about exactly the, a lot of nautical books, a lot set in the Far East. Um, and the Malay Archipelago was, quote, his favorite bedside book. And Wallace features. So Lord Jim, um, and there, this is a movie poster, Peter O'Toole. That's the good old days, wasn't it, when men were men. <laughs> um, uh, this is Lord Jim. Lord Jim is sort of very loosely modeled on the life of James Brooke, actually. In Lord Jim, however, is an entomologist called Stein, who is Alfred Russell Wallace, manifestly. Um, here's a passage in from the Malay Archipelago. This is Wallace. Um, and this is describing capturing one of these things. And this, again, has the Wallace slide. This is a lovely piece of writing. The next day, I went again to the same shrub and succeeded in catching a female. And the day after, a fine male. This is the male. And I found it to be as I had expected, a perfectly new and most magnificent species, Ornithoptera croesus, and one of the most gorgeously colored butterflies in the world. Fine specimens of the male are more than seven inches across the wings, which are velvety back and fiery orange, the latter color replacing the green of the allied species. This is the, this is the, the technical description. The beauty and brilliancy of this insect are indescribable, and none but a naturalist can understand the intense excitement I experienced when at length I captured it. On taking it out of my net and opening the glorious wings, my heart began to beat violently. The blood rushed to my head, and I felt much more like fainting than I've done when in apprehension of immediate death. I had a headache for the rest of the day. So great was the excitement produced by what will appear to most people a very inadequate cause. I just think it's a beautiful piece of writing. And Conrad knows his good pieces of writing. So here's Stein in Lord Jim. I got him! When I got up, I shook like a leaf with excitement. And when I opened those beautiful wings and made sure what a rare and so extraordinary perfect specimen I had, my head went round and my legs became so weak with emotion that I had to sit on the ground. So I do think that's, I, mean, I, I really want to finish with that. I think it's remarkable. We have a book of science, a book of observation, a book of anthropology, a book of linguistics. He even has an appendix um, where he's got common words from multiple languages that he encountered. I mean, this guy is, is a true sort of vacuum cleaner in terms of information, <laughs> which he's then regurgitating in the pages of the um, Malay Archipelago, as long as <laughs> he's regurgitating everything except the really stuff we excite, we want to know about, which is how did you discover evolution by natural selection. That's a bit personal. Um, uh, my final slide is this. Uh, this is Thomas Henry Huxley. Most of you, he's the guy, remember, who had the duh moment over evolution by natural selection. Best known as Darwin's bulldog. So Darwin is sitting at home feeling poorly and a little frail and fragile. He doesn't want to go out and, and into combat on behalf of his ideas. So he has his boys, as his bulldog, go out and attack. He's a defender of the Darwinian orthodoxy. Huxley is, a, is not easy to please. And he has this wonderful statement made shortly after Wallace came back from Southeast Asia. To say, he's, there's no, he's not one, he's not somebody, he's, he's not a sycophant, is old T.H. Huxley. Um, Once in a generation, he writes, a Wallace may be found physically, mentally, and morally qualified to wander unscathed through the tropical wilds of America and Asia to form magnificent collections as he wanders, 
and I think this is the important thing, and with all, to think out sagaciously the conclusions suggested by collection. He's surviving, he's making remarkable collections, but he's having these extraordinary synthetic meta insights. That's extraordinary. And so this is actually the conclusion of my introduction to this edition. Uh, in light of the Malay archipelago, we might add to this judgment that it is seldom too that such exploratory zeal and scientific brilliance are coupled so providentially with a facility for writing lyrically and passionately, yet precisely about hazardous journeys, curious geographies, spectacular species, unimagined, pl unimagined places, and extraordinary peoples. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them, but uh, don't feel constrained to sit here and wait through that process. You should be rushing out to, buying co to buy copies of the book, obviously. <laughs> Any questions? No, yes? Something about the Wallace line, so I understand it a bit. Oh, sure. Um, the Wallace line is this discontinuity between the Australasian and the Asian, Asian flora and fauna. So on the Australasian side, you don't have monkeys. You have cuscus and phalanger, uh, whereas you've got monkeys on the, uh, on the Asian side. Now, why is that? We know that there, it turns out that Southeast Asia is on two separate tectonic plates, and Borneo, Java, and Sumatra on one, and so that's actually relatively shallow water, and then New Guinea and the islands to the west are on another one, also fairly shallow, but between them, is a deep water trench. And what's more, we know now from plate tectonics, Wallace didn't know this, that these things were much further apart and they've drifted closer to each other. So that their current propinquity is recent in geological term. So, so in a sense, there's still, a, I mean, over time, things will spread and that boundary will be gradually erased. But it's, it's recent enough that that boundary is still alive and well. Yes, sir. Oh, Darwin didn't. Uh, Darwin did not steal anything. I mean, Dar uh, this is the nice thing. Darwin uh, was even worse than Wallace in terms of writing everything down. So we have we have this ridiculously comprehensive set of Darwin's notes. Darwin, oh, I mean, my, so famously, he was sick for a lot of time. had had all sorts of bowel problems. We know how many times he had diarrhea and how many times he threw up. I mean, we really do. And a friend of mine wants to write a book entitled "The Origin of Feces." Um, um, so we. And he had written in 1844 when um, Wallace is still, you know, it's actually the year that he met uh, Bates when he's, he's becoming turned on to Beatles. He wrote down his theory. So he had a first draft of his theory. D Darwin had a first draft of his theory. Um, uh, uh, and it was actually, it's really interesting. So that same book that really turned Wallace on, The Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, that book, I think, had a very severe, if you like, retarding effect on Darwin. Why? Here's a theory of evolution. What happened to that theory of, yeah, fine, Queen Victoria heard it read to her in a German accent, but every scientist who reviewed that book jumped down its throat. This is poor science, it's polemical, it's, it's heretical, right? Including, by the way, some of the harshest reviewers were Darwin's direct mentors at Cambridge. So what's Darwin? Darwin's there, he's on the brink. I've got my ideas. I, <laughs> right? So what he does is he decides, he's not in a hurry, he's independently wealthy, comfortable, he doesn't have to rush this thing out, he can, he can be careful and serious about it. So he draws back and decides to consolidate, 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 okay? So first comment is, no, I mean there's no, it, it's actually a fantastic case study in the history of science. These two people really did generate this same idea, which had been apparently elusive for generations and generations and generations. This is something people have been thinking, people have been thinking about since they started thinking, right? Every creation myth 
is an attempt to explain the things that evolution by natural selection explains. And yet, nobody got there until these two, and it's until 1858 or mid. So what that is, it's not about the people. Okay? What it is, it's about the social, cultural, technical milieu in which these guys found themselves. It's no accident, for example, that it was found by British people. Now, I, British people like to think that's because we're smarter than other people, but it's not. It's because at that stage, we had a very, very serious maritime empire. And both, now, Darwin was on a naval expedition, so that's straightforward. Wallace wasn't, but his access to everything was facilitated by the fact, you know, if somebody got in Mr. Wallace's way, they'd send a gunboat to, to clear the way. Um, so it's actually a, a remarkable case where you've got a confluence of factors which have resulted in these two, you know, just sort of fairly normal people independently. So the way I actually, the way I like to think of it is, previously, courtesy of the church and so on, these simple ideas have been rather high-hanging fruit. Then, courtesy things like laissez-faire economics, the imperial travel opportunities, as I've described, uh, the industrial revolution suddenly making things act on your behalf. You don't, aren't magical, right? A, a steam engine is just a pile of coal, right? And some water, rather, whereas a horse is rather more mysterious, okay? So there's a whole bunch of things, which has caused that high-hanging fruit to come down much lower. And suddenly it's accessible to the likes of Darwin and Wallace. And look, I know I may say poor old Darwin uh, with respect to Wallace. Darwin was brilliant. And the, the work he did post-origin so the descent of man, his analysis of human evolution, his theory of sexual selection, it's all stupendous. And, and one of the reasons, by the way, um, he, he has survived so much better than Wallace is, Wallace kept doing science, but Wallace was all over. Wallace used his newfound prominence to engage with every underdog cause he could possibly find. He was an anti-vaxxer, for crying out loud. He became a spiritualist. He believed, can you believe this, that women should have the vote. Um, he was a he was an outspoken socialist. Um, so whereas Darwin consolidated, concretized, focused. So yes, don't get it. I don't, yeah, I love Darwin too. Just not that much. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, so, uh, the f so uh, I personally think that the, the background differences between the two have, has been overplayed. So Wallace, as, as I say, Wallace was poor, but only because his father, his father hung out with Bo Brummel in Bath in the, in the <laughs> social season. I mean, his father was just, it was feckless. And remember, this is Britain, so that you can, you can be incredibly poor, but still relatively upper class. Now, there's no question that uh, money made Darwin's life a hell of a lot of easy. Yes, he was, he was a man of leisure. And Wallace, by the way, inherited his father's fecklessness with money. He was wealthy when he came back from Southeast Asia. His agent had done a fantastically good job in terms of... Uh, selling his material and investing the proceeds, okay? Uh, Wallace took over and promptly lost everything. He used to make a living, and this is the most excruciating thing I can think of. Um, he used to make a living grading. He was a professional exam grader. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, and it was, and there's, a very lovely, there's a lovely finale to this story because um, he was rescued from penury by Darwin. Darwin arranged for a government pension of 200 pounds a year. This was a year before Darwin died for Wallace. So, uh, so yes, there was a social divide, but it wasn't. A, I mean, a, a, but and there was certainly a serious financial divide. Uh, Darwin was an extremely astute investor, but did that have an impact upon? No, I think their perception of Malthus was pretty similar. Um, th it's well, we know that Darwin was highly. Uh, Malthus was the guy who pointed out the, the simple if you like, almost truism, that 
natural populations, he was thinking about the human population, but this applies to any population, has the capacity for exponential increase, and yet resources are unlikely to increase at that rate. What does that mean? That means we're going to run out of resources at some stage. Okay? Um, and that's obviously a fundamental underpinning of the idea of natural selection. We know that it had a big impact on uh, Darwin. Wallace, Wallace only wrote down his account because he didn't write about it in the um, Malay Archipelago. It was only later. So, for example, 1905, he published his autobiography. He gives us an account of how he came up with the idea. And so he's reconstructing what he was thinking about 50 years prior uh, in a malarial delirium. So, I mean, there's obviously an element of interpretation there. And he, he does say that Malthus was a key player from in that story. And I've always been slightly suspicious, again, because of his, his hero worship of Darwin, that Malthus was part of the Darwin story. He was sort of buckling his chariot to, to that, that same vehicle, so to speak. Uh, I might be unfair. But I don't think there was any major departure there. On sexual selection, there definitely was a major departure. So, and by the way, this is a lovely illustration of uh, these guys' relationship. Um, uh, as I say, there's no question that Wallace really admired Darwin. Um, and, Do and Darwin certainly really appreciated the toing and froing he had intellectually in their letters. They're really detailed bang, bang, bang letters on these points like sexual selection. There were two things, two big things they disagreed upon. Sexual selection. Wallace didn't like the idea that you could assume that a, quote, simple organism could make ascetic judgments, which is what it came down to, ultimately. Um, Darwin had no such problems. The second thing that they disagreed was on human evolution. Uh, and this was a real problem. And again, another reason why I think Wallace has been eclipsed. Wallace was a spiritualist, so you needed to have some kind of insertion of a spirit. You needed some, some kind of intervention. He wouldn't have a, a regular god, but there was something amaterial about the process. So there, there was two, these two big bones of contention between the two of them. 1871, Darwin writes The Descent of Man, which is a book about human evolution and sexual selection. So he writes this nice letter, friendly letter to um, Wallace. says, look, I'm really sorry about this, but my next book is basically a condensation of everything we disagree upon. Okay, I'm really sorry. This is really going to get up your nose. And Wallace writes back, and, if, and this is such a model for doing such. He writes back, That's just, that sounds fantastic. I look forward to being crushed by the mountain of your facts. <laughs> Isn't that it? Bring it on! Um, but uh, Wallace was somewhat inconsistent in his application of sexual selection. He didn't like sexual selection. By the way, he didn't like the term selection uh, at all. He didn't like the term natural selection. It was another cause of disagreement. So sexual selection fell under the, the same rubric. Why? Uh, for Darwin, the important thing was the analogy with artificial selection. So you're a farmer. You are artificially selecting cattle for increased milk yield. You're only breeding from the ones with the best milk yield. So that's chapter one of the origin of species, right? And we're all comfortable with that. And then it's almost a sort of sleight of hand. And then you say, you don't need the farmer because this is going to happen in nature. You're comfortable with about thinking about it on the farm. So it should be, you should be comfortable thinking about it in uh, nature. Well, no, says Wallace. If you're using the word selection, that implies a selector. And that's the whole point. You've got the bloody farmer. And therefore, the, the tendency, if you're going to call it natural selection, is there's some divine selector designing things. Um, so w Wallace actually preferred Herbert Spencer's term, survival of the fittest, to natural selection. So he objected to sexual selection on these, the, the ascetic choice ground. He objected to it because it was using the S word again, that selection. Um, but he then used it. And so uh, in this way, and it's a very ingenious argument. I think it's slightly fatuous. He was a socialist. Um, and he had this sort of utopian vision of humans getting ever better. He was also a, what today you would call, I suppose, a feminist. I mean, he, as they, he was very early weighing in in terms of women's opportunity, women's votes. He believed that the reason humans have problems, or did then, was the lack of s opportunity for women to exercise what Darwin would call sexual selection. By which his vision was, if you're a woman, you don't really get to choose your partner because you're in this benighted 
if you like, unfree position. So you you just you're sort of on the market, and then you just take who you know the the best priced individual who comes along, whatever. So you're not exercising any choice. So he had a vision of the emancipation of women. So women, instead of just taking the first guy with a with a fat pocketbook who made these bad news genetically and everything else, um, women actually exercise their choice. So sexual selection, and that way will improve the human stock. So bizarrely, that really is an application of, of Darwin's sexual, se sexual selection thinking. But that was OK for Wallace, because humans, yes, we can make aesthetic and other judgments. But can peacocks? He would say no. Any, well, I don't want to keep you too long. Any, uh, one more question. Yes, sir. Um, so two comments. Wallace was deeply unself-promoting, <laughs> as 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 I make the point. I mean, so he writes a book about his adventures. It's all somewhat self-deprecating. He doesn't talk about his great discovery. He's the only person who writes an autobiography. You know, an autobiography is where you settle scores. You explain whoever ever disagreed with you is a moron. Um, <laughs> and, and it's all about self-justification. He has a section in his autobiography about certain deficiencies in my mental equipment. So I wasn't very good at this. And that segment on his bad swimming is part of his autobiography. So he's all, as I say, it's almost this pathological non-self-promotion. His wife, actually, um, was a spiritualist with him. So they were both very active in the spiritualist cause. Um, and, this, and he wrote multiple books on spiritualism. This was a, he tried, you know, there's, Thomas Henry Huxley, the man who gave us the word agnostic. And Wallace says, why don't you come to a seance with me sometime? And it's not the person to ask. Um, uh, so they were, uh, and he had this slightly strange sort of materialism meets spiritualism perspective. As we assume his wife did, we don't know much about Annie, to be honest. He, the two volume autobiography, he doesn't actually mention her by name. He refer, in that passage about his marriage, he refers to it as the daughter of his friend, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he does refer to his wife or we on a few occasions. But it's really, it's, it's stunning how little we know about it. But uh, I, the other thing I would have to add to that is the sort of traditional vision, and Janet Brown, who's the great Darwin scholar, has a great description of this, of Emma Darwin as a spiritual policeman or policewoman. Right, who's sort of, she's very doctrinaire, evangelical Christian, and, and you know, everything is black and white, and if you're not on our side, you're against us. That's completely naive. Uh, it's inaccurate. She was a very sophisticated uh, person, sophisticated thinker. Yes, she, uh, there's no question she was concerned about her husband's, you know, uh, spiritual destiny, if you like. Um, but it, it, it really wasn't as antagonistic or as... As, as awkward as I think a lot of the popular media would make out to be. As I say, I'm much, I, I think he did delay, and he certainly knew that what he was doing was, was dangerous and heretical, and I'm sure that the fact that he would upset his nearest and dearest was part of that story. But I, I suspect that seeing his scientific colleagues trash Chambers' book was much more, much, you know, loomed much larger in his personal universe than... than Conjugal concerns would be my guess. Okay, uh, most tragic and inappropriate that we we finish with a discussion of Darwin, but whatever. That's 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 the way it is. <laughs>